This video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you need a website or domain, visit squarespace.com forward slash Simon. Hey everybody, and welcome back to a new video. Whenever one starts into a new hobby, we can't help but come across a set of rules, usually made with good intentions and as helpful reminders to help people remember certain principles. The trouble is many of these can actually be a detriment over time as they're often applied too globally or while good for the beginner, limit your growth as you get more advanced. In this video, I'll walk you through seven common photography rules and show why and how you should break them. I hope you'll stay for my bonus tip where I'll show you how to take photos like this and this, even if we need to break some rules. My name is Simon D'Entremont and I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. The first of these rules that are often used in photography is that you shouldn't crop your photos or that only amateur photographers crop their photos. There is absolutely no reason in this day to avoid cropping if that's what you need to get the composition you want and it's certainly not more professional to not crop. Most cameras today have plenty of megapixels to crop a bit and some higher megapixel cameras when combined with a sharp lens allow for deep crops. In wildlife or when shooting fast action, there isn't always time to adjust your composition to taste. You focus on getting the shot and we crop it afterwards to what looks the best. There's nothing wrong with shooting a shot a little bit wider than you need and using cropping and post-processing to fine tune the proportions, look and feel of your photo later. Crop out the stuff you don't like, but try and include the stuff that you like the best. You can even leave enough room for deciding later if a vertical or horizontal crop is best or just freehand a crop that best serves the shot. This one is actually a tip that serves a solid purpose when just starting out, but really limits you later. Shooting with the sun at your back is indeed the easiest way to start taking photos as the subject and background are evenly illuminated, the dynamic range from light to dark is less, and there isn't any difficult shadows or backlighting to deal with. But backlighting when done correctly can be an amazing tool in photography. It creates beautiful rim light on your subjects and dramatic elements to your scene. Some tips on maximizing backlighting are to make sure that the sun is low on the horizon, not too high in the sky. A dark background will really accentuate any rim light. Watch out placing the sun directly next to your subject. You may flood your camera with so much light that you'll lose any detail. Experiment with the position of the sun. Often 10 or 20 degrees off to a side works well, or maybe even right behind your subject to block some light. By the way, if you want to learn more about shooting in backlit situations, if you sign up for my email list on my website, you can download my guide on shooting backlit for free. Link in the comments below. This is often a prized characteristic of photos, and indeed it looks great in some genres, but there are plenty of creative photography opportunities that don't need sharp photos. Indeed, some prefer not being sharp. One technique is ICM or intentional camera movement where you use the movement to create shapes and streaks while the shutter is open. It can give a great artistic effect. Another technique is panning with slow shutter speeds to freeze the subject, but blur other parts of the photo, like the prop of a helicopter, the wings of a bird, or the wheels and backgrounds of a moving car. To note, the only sharp part of this photo is the water and neither duck is sharp, but it's still okay. Time to experiment. The next rule is the rule of thirds. This is used to help guide composition and is actually a good place to start. You divide the frame horizontally and vertically into thirds and place significant lines or objects on the lines or at the intersections. This can work fine, for example, where you might place a horizon or subjects on the thirds or significant points of interest at the intersections. My view is that the main function is actually to prohibit you from getting too close to the edges and crowding your important elements or avoids the center, which may be the least interesting place to put your subject. But don't let this stop you from exploring other options. The center can work great to create a nice symmetry when a subject is facing you. Or placing a horizon in the middle can work well if both the top and the bottom of the photo are equally weighted with interest. Or sometimes you just want to freehand a composition till it feels balanced, interesting, and highlights the right elements in your photo. I'd like to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. I used Squarespace to make my very own website and it was really, really easy. 
They have lots of templates to choose from, or you can customize pages with easy drag and drop sections for photos, clickable buttons, text, or links. When I recently added tours to Botswana to my offerings, it was easy to add a new page to my website with photos, videos, and just drop in text boxes anywhere I wanted one. Using Squarespace, you can even get people to subscribe to your newsletter and offer them a free download in return if you wish. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Simon to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Another myth that's out there is that you need to be a pro at image processing to get great photos. This just isn't true. There are plenty of genres in photography that give a priority to a natural look and feel, and plenty of photos that when well captured in the first place, don't need much processing. When it comes to wildlife, some of my photos can indeed be improved upon with some processing, like going from this photo to this. But does that mean you have to process to get great pics? Not at all. I have photos that my finished product is not that different from the original, like from this to this, or this to this. Processing is an artistic choice you can make about your photography, not a rite of passage to excellence. Processing can help you rescue photos shot in poor light or alter the look if your genre wants to see that, but it's your choice. One of the many tools in your toolkit, but not a mandatory one. The next photography rule to totally ignore is real photographers shoot in manual. What a bunch of baloney. Now I'm not saying that shooting in manual is bad and that it doesn't give you the maximum in control of your camera. It does, and learning how to shoot in manual can be a great asset. I shoot in manual when shooting landscapes and astrophotography, but when I'm shooting fast action like wildlife, I shoot using auto ISO, as the camera can adjust it faster than I ever could, and I want to focus on getting the shot, not fiddling with my settings. There are plenty of professional photographers that also shoot in aperture priority or shutter priority, as their genre prioritizes control over aperture, and shutter speed and is agnostic as to the other settings. That's 100% fine and certainly not less pro than shooting in full manual. Use what works for you and helps you get the shot. There's no reason you can't shoot in one of the semi-automatic modes and get great photos of the highest quality. Just make sure you pick a mode that gives you control over the settings you need to control and that lets the camera control the things that aren't critical in getting the shot or the look that you want. Another rule that I think needs some balancing being applied is fill the frame. This one has somehow gone from being a compositional technique to being taught as a rule of photography, as in you should fill the frame. The basis here is to fill the frame with your subject, giving them the largest and most obvious share of the real estate. While this is a great technique to make intimate images with subjects or get great details to show prominently or get rid of distracting elements in the background, I'd say this one is a tip to use when it serves a purpose, not a goal of your photography. There are plenty of photos that are best revealed as a subject within a scene, not just a subject. The scene, environment, or location can add lots of information about the photo and the situation, adding more elements, either real or implied, to your photo. What's a sports photo of an athlete at the Olympics without the Olympic rings in the background to give the photo a sense of place? Otherwise, it could be any athlete in any gym. What's your favorite rule to break? Let me know in the comments below. One piece of advice that's often given that we should really ignore is that your histogram should be like a mountain, tall in the middle and sloping away towards the right and the left. This would mean that your photo has lots of pixels in the middle tones and fewer and fewer pixels in the tones that are very dark and very light. While many photos end up this way, there's no reason to pursue this as a goal. There are indeed reasons why you may want to avoid clipping the whites or blacks by having them touch the edges of the histogram, but dark images will have a peak on the left and bright images will have a peak on the right. There may even be images where pure blacks and pure whites are an intentional part of the photo. A histogram should be used as a guide to help you achieve what you want, not make your photo fit a pre-supposed template. If this discussion about histograms made you wish you knew a little bit more about them, I have a whole video on histograms, which you can see right here. I hope you can use this information to go out and break some photography rules, allowing you to graduate from using these as rules to guidelines that may have their place, but may even be better when broken. I know you can do it.